This is Ken Hellevang, Agricultural Engineer with the NGSU Extension Service, and we're looking at a series of clips on cleaning a flooded house. And this is the final of five uh, video clips in the series, and this one is on drying the structure. It's very important uh, that we focus on drying the structure because that's what's going to prevent any mold growth in the future uh, and mold growth as we found in the earlier presentations is indeed a health hazard and we don't want that mold in our home or it'll start causing us respiratory problems in the future. So the structural drying is a critical step in the cleanup process. For structural drying to occur, we need to open all of the enclosed areas. So we're talking opening opening the walls. Uh, if we have the floor, even if it's a vinyl and we got water underneath, we need to open them up so that we can dry. And this drying may take just a, a several days or it may take weeks. Uh, it'll depend on the drying conditions, how much airflow that we have going through the structure. Shown here are two different uh, pictures of homes that are in the drying process. And I want to just show uh, the house on the left there. You can see the, the white uh, discoloration that is on the brick facing. And that's because moisture is coming through the concrete. We have this effervescence of, of moisture that comes through. And uh, as I indicated in the earlier slide, uh, it's critical that we make sure that the weep holes are open so that the water drains out. And then we need airflow both on the inside of the structure and on the outside to facilitate that drying. On the picture on the right, uh, that moisture is showing up as a darkened color. And again, it's indicating moisture is coming from the structure. And, and if you look closely, you can even see that there's moisture inside the house. And, and there'll be condensation issues on the windows uh, if we're not getting that moisture uh, removed from the home. And if we don't keep the humidity level low enough, that's going to lead to mold growth for certain and probably uh, structural deterioration as well. The drying process really involves circulating air across those surfaces. We need to get them opened up. We need to get airflow blowing against that surface to aid in the drying process. And then we need to make sure that the air that we're moving across the structure is, is dry air. And the way that we do that is to bring outside air in that's dry and it picks up moisture from within the house and then we exhaust that to the outdoors. And what we recommend is that you put a fan in the window facing out again so that we're drawing the air into the house uh, and then blowing the air to the outdoors. To get a, a good suction created within the house, uh, we need to uh, put some kind of sheeting or whatever around the fan and close the fan so that we make sure that we're able to create a vacuum. And we'll want to move a lot of this air through the house to help with the drying process. Frequently people will ask about using de dehumidifiers. Uh, should I be de running a dehumidifier rather than, than opening up the house? And I really recommend initially that we ventilate, we use fans, and we bring outdoor air through. And that's important because we can remove gallons of water a day with moving outdoor air through the house, where most of our home dehumidifiers are going to be taking out pints of water per day. And so uh, it, once we start getting the structure dried down, then we can go to using dehumidifiers. But initially, uh, what we're going to want to do is, is to be using a lot of outdoor air moving by to dry the structure. I really encourage people to be measuring the relative humidity to know how we're progressing with the, the drying process. Uh, and humidity gauges are available both in a digital format as well as the mechanical types. 
Uh, regardless of which one you're using, I recommend that we calibrate it to make sure that it's giving us accurate readings. And the best way to do that is to take a, a cup, put a quarter cup of salt in there, a half a cup of water into that cup, put it into a plastic bag like a gallon Ziploc bag, put the cup and the meter in there, seal it up, and I let it sit for 12 hours. After that 12 hour period, we would expect the relative humidity within the bag to be about 75 percent, assuming room temperature. Uh, and so that'll give us an indication of, of whether the meter is giving us an accurate reading or not, and then we can probably modify the reading uh, to give us an accurate reading. And what we want to do is to measure the humidity in the house. We, uh, since moles will grow at humidity levels exceeding about 70 percent, our goal should be to keep the humidity level in the in the home in the structure under 70 percent, moving a lot of airflow through uh, to keep that drying process going and keeping the humidity level under 70 percent during that drying process. Particularly as we start getting later into fall and into cooler temperatures uh, or into spring, if we're looking at spring flooding, uh, we can enhance the moisture holding capacity by adding heat to the air. Uh, but it's important that we, we do both warm the air and move the air or exchange the air that's within the house. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that the warmer it is, the more rapid mold will grow. And so there's a little bit of a balancing act. And generally what we look at is, is keeping the air temperature in the, in the home or in the structure under about 72 degrees. That's warm enough that it, it, we get good uh, evaporation occurring, good drying occurring, uh, but we're not so warm that we're really enhancing the mold growth. Uh, but we need both the, the warmth and exchanging the air. If we don't have the windows open to bring dry outside air in, we're just going to create a sauna. We're going to have warm, moist air in the house uh, and not accomplish drying. And so we need to still, at least periodically, be opening the windows, getting the air exchange, uh, as well as having the, the warmth to help enhance the evaporation. We need to continue drying until the moisture or the content of the wood is low enough that we're not going to have mold growth. And uh, typically what we're looking at with mold growth, again, is, is moisture contents of the wood exceeding about 15 percent. So our goal should always be to get the moisture content of the wood below 15 percent uh, as quick as we can. and also, we can't be enclosing any walls or doing any reconstruction until we're below that 15% moisture content. Uh, and what we have on the slide here shows that if we're at 70% humidity at roughly room temperature, uh, that puts us at uh, just under 15% moisture. And so you'll see different numbers. Uh, some will say we need to be down to 13 percent moisture to assure that we're not going to have any mold growth and that is going to be safer but certainly we need to be under 15 percent. The only way that we're going to know when the moisture content is low enough is to use a moisture meter. Uh, actually check the moisture content of the wood, check the moisture content of materials. There are a couple of different kinds of meters. Uh, some of them actually have little pins on the end that you push into the wood and measure the moisture content or the material. Others uh, have some pads on the back and you just set it on the surface and it will measure the moisture content that way. But it's important that either you check the moisture content or have someone else check the moisture content before you do any rebuilding. Make sure that the wood is dry. The NDSU Extension Service uh, has moisture meters available in our county extension offices uh, that you can check out and use uh, to check the moisture content. Uh, many of the contractors and other places will also have meters. 
would look to make sure that you're getting an accurate moisture reading. Uh, verify what the accuracy of that meter is uh, that you're using to assure that that moisture content is low enough for safe rebuilding. The saturated soils will take a long time to, to dry out. And so we can very quickly dry out the main floor, the structural wood, but when we start talking about basements, uh, it's going to take a long time for the moisture that's within the soil to, to dry out. And that moisture will be moving into the basement. It may initially come in, as shown in this picture, in liquid form, but more frequently it's going to be in a vapor form. And so it will look dry, but there may actually be gallons of water per day coming through the concrete, which is fairly porous to, to vapor, and it'll come through in that vapor form and add to the, the moisture load in the home. And so we need to be concerned about keeping the ventilation going, not only to dry the materials, but to handle the moisture load that will be coming in through the basement. One of the things that we recommend uh, to really determine if the moisture is still coming through is to just take a piece of clear plastic, maybe a couple, two or three feet uh, on a side, tape it to the floor, tape it to the wall, uh, make sure that it's taped tightly to that surface, let it sit there for a day or a couple days, and look to see if moisture accumulates on the backside. It may actually show up as condensation on the plastic. It may show up as a discoloration or darkening of the concrete. But look to see if that moisture vapor is still coming through. And that'll give us an indication of the amount of moisture that's coming through and whether it's going to be safe to, to start rebuilding. And frequently we're looking at uh, this dry down process in the basement of taking months. And so even though the main floor we can dry and, and probably rebuild fairly quickly in the basement, uh, rebuilding really needs to be delayed until we are, can be assured that there's no moisture coming through. Another thing that we'll frequently see after a flood event or when we have uh, a lot of moisture in the soils is that we have this white fluffy material that shows up along cracks in the floor or maybe even just showing up on the concrete floor or on the con block wall as is shown in the, these pictures. And that is not mold. Uh, what that is is a salt. They, there's salts within the soil and as the moisture moves through the soil it picks up the salt as it comes through the concrete, the moisture evaporates into the air and leaves the salt deposit behind. And when it typically will look like a white, fluffy material. And you can determine if it's a salt by putting a little bit of water on it, and it'll typically dissolve. Or there's a few, some salts where you need to put on a little bit of vinegar for it to, to dissolve but most of ours just a few drops of water and you will see it disappear. And a fairly easy way to determine whether it's salt or whether it's, it's mold growth and frequently it's going to be uh, a salt accumulation. And it really doesn't create a health hazard but is an indication of moisture coming through the soil and it will continue until that moisture around the house has uh, dissipated and, and that area is all dried out. So that brings us to the end of the section on uh, drying your home and, and how important it is that we do dry out the structure. Uh, this series of five uh, video clips hopefully will help you uh, as you look at, at doing the cleanup in your own home or if you're looking at having someone help you with it to know that the steps that they should be going through. So this has been Ken Hellevang, uh, Agricultural Engineer with the NDSU Extension Service, and we have a lot of information available on our website uh, that you can find by just doing a search for NDSU flood information.